Thank you for joining us for today's Climates of Inequality program. Um, before we get started, there's just a few things to keep in mind. Um, I just wanted to do a quick access check. So please let us know if the audio is okay. Let us know in the chat for that one. Also let us know if you are able to access the live caption option by clicking more and captions um, and then show captions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any questions about accessibility throughout the program, please uh, message us and we will guide you through that process. Uh, as always, please be mindful of the virtual space. Uh, use the comment, or excuse me, use the chat for comments or questions, and we will try our best to get to them towards the end of the program. And I also uh, wanted to share my screen really quickly. And what you're going to see on your screen uh, is a purple background with black text featuring a short land acknowledgement. Um, so we just like to acknowledge that in the spirit of healing, we acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the Chicagoland area the Three Fires Confederacy, the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe nations, as well as other tribal nations that know this area as their ancestral homeland, including the Menominee, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Peoria, and Sac and Fox. Further, we recognize that indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards uh, of the land that we now occupy and acknowledge that this land is the current home to one of the largest urban Native American communities in the United States. Native people are part of Chicago's past, present, and future. And finally, to acknowledge is to act. We encourage everybody um, to consider the multitude of ways to translate knowledge and thoughts into active support for indigenous peoples and communities locally, nationally, and around the world. So with that, um, again, thank you for joining us. And I will pass the virtual mic to our center director, Rosa Cabrera. Thank you, Lauren. And good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Rosa Cabrera, director of the Rafael Center Ortiz uh, Latino Cultural Center at UIC, uh, better known as the uh, LCC. Um, thank you for uh, joining us in, this is the last Climates of Inequality presentation, like Lauren mentioned, uh, for the academic year. Um, we're now in the fourth season and you can access the previous presentations through the link that we're gonna put uh, on the chat shortly. Uh, this fall, the uh, LCC and Social Justice Initiative are partnering to host these virtual uh, presentations alongside uh, the Climates of Inequality Traveling Exhibition, which is now showing in the Chicago Justice Gallery. Um, this is a remarkable exhibition uh, that tells the story of seven communities in the US, uh, in Puerto Rico, Colombia, and Mexico, and includes the story of Chicago uh, uh, Little Village, developing collaboration with community partners, Alianza Americas, and Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, uh, known as El Bejo. Uh, the exhibition expands the Chicago story of Little Village to feature other sacrifice zones in the city, including Algen Gardens, Calumet River, McKinley Park, Pilsen, and the Southeast uh, side, where environmental harms have disproportionately affected Black and Latinx residents for generations. Um, also, you'll be able to find more information on the exhibition uh, on the chat. Um, for this semester, the hours um, are very limited, but we're hoping that for the next semester, we'll have more um, hours available to keep the, uh, to be able to open the, uh, the gallery. Uh, the presentation today will bring us uh, the work of an environmental justice and economic development grassroots organization in West Woodland on Chicago's South Side, called Blacks in Green. We will learn their various climate solutions centered on rebuilding Black communities through self-sustaining and cultural relevant efforts. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, um, I would like to give a few shout outs uh, to our co-sponsors uh, and partners, uh, starting with the partners, they include Social Justice Initiative and organizations Alianza America and Albejo for their ongoing partnership over the past five years uh, or so. And to the Humanities Action Lab, uh, where Climates of Inequality Project resides for helping us sustain this program with funding from the Mellon Foundation. Um, to our co-sponsors, they include the UIC Sustainability Fee, the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies, Department of Anthropology, Freshwater Lab, Great 
Cities Institute, Las Ganas Project, and Museums and Exhibition Studies. And also to the students panelists in my environmental and climate justice class, who will facilitate a short conversation with our guest speaker after the presentation. Uh, they are Leticia Diaz Leon, uh, in Mahela Rivas Abreu, Alden Larson, and Tanisha Lopez Rodriguez. Uh, now, it is an honor to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Naomi Davis, who is the founding member and CEO of Blacks in Green, known as BIG. Now, uh, Naomi is an urban terrorist, attorney, activist, and proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers. Her heritage formed the foundation of BIG's course in Graninomics which Naomi author and teaches nationally in community lectures and workshops at universities. Naomi serves as a bridge and catalyst among communities and their stakeholders in the design and development of green, self-sustaining, meets income and walkable villages within black neighborhoods. She communicates the risk of global warming, the health and wealth opportunity of the new green economy, the power of neighbors to lead in their city's environmental policy and practice and the centrality of land no. ownership. So welcome to our program, Naomi, and it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am super duper excited to be here. I'm gonna jump right in uh, with my screen share um, so that we can, um, take this journey together. I, um, before I uh, leap in, I do want to give a soul level shout out to El Vejo, uh, Kim Wasserman Nieto and Juliana Pino are my goddesses. Um, they, uh, along with Cheryl Johnson of People for Community Recovery, who were also mentioned in the introduction, are deep allies uh, from whom I learned so much and uh, who are part of a nurturing and caring system uh, called the Chicago Environmental Justice Network, uh, which is um, based in relationship and based in a mutual mission for environmental justice. And I also wanna give a shout out to uh, Freshwater Lab, which you also mentioned, who uh, has been a, a friend and ally of BIG for uh, many years now. So with that as the background, I'll say greetings cousins. <laughs> we, we do have an approach, a foundational philosophy, a spirit that we come with. We come in kinship uh, and we believe that uh, the uh, hard conversations that many of us must have now uh, and the long game that many of us are playing right now um, has to be fortified by a foundation um, based in kinship. And so when you have um, to disagree, uh, when you have to push your point, when you have to be no holes barred or um, not take no for an answer, you're also not wanting to be scorched earth. You're uh, not wanting to be burning bridges. Uh, you're wanting to see people with the eyes of love and uh, see them as human beings um, so that there's a, a little access point where you all can communicate through uh, notwithstanding any differences. And it's part of the technology we call engineering hope. And with um, the students, we are super duper encouraged because um, I grew up as a child of the civil rights movement. And at the time when I was um, a baby girl, um, they were still uh, lynching blacks uh, as a matter of course in the South, um, 13 miles as the pro flies from where my mom was born uh, in Mentor City, Mississippi. Uh, Emmett Till was murdered in 1955, the year of my birth. In fact, I was born the day before he was killed. And we um, bring with us at Blacks and Green a the venerable tradition of students, activists uh, engaged, putting it on the line. At Blacks and Green, we talk about a new terms of engagement between the front line 
and our um, white allies. And what there is to know is that freedom seekers like we are, like some of you are, that first you got to know you're not free. Then you got to make a commitment, take that first step. And then you reach out across the bounds of race and class to others also willing to give their all. And so in my time, uh, they were students called the Freedom Riders. And I don't know you're, you're, if, if you're not students of history, you wouldn't necessarily know it. But when I think about students, when I look at you, I see champions, I see heroes and heroines. And I just wanna thank you for being the hope of tomorrow. And um, I, uh, so I am hoping that you will um, be able to be uh, a vision of yourself that inspires you. And uh, let me see. I'm going to stop sharing for just one quick second to see what happened to my screen. I apologize. So Oh, okay. That about big. Engineering hope. Escape. There we go. So just a little bit about um blacks and green. We uh we are uh living at the intersection of environment, economy, and equity. And uh, we are that, uh, the creators, as, as, our, uh, as our speaker has said, of the sustainable square mile of uh, grannynomics and the eight principles of green village building. And basically, it's a lot of different ways to talk about how do you have a thriving community anymore? How do you have that walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play village? Uh, in our case, where African Americans own the businesses, own the land, and live the conservation lifestyle. We call the conservation lifestyle the beautiful life. And we, um, we mean that because our whole vision is self-sustaining Black communities everywhere. And the idea that those kinds of communities uh, went extinct in my lifetime um, is uh, that heartbreaking, churning feeling that moved me into action. So uh, young students, it's not just your joy that you wanna pay attention to, and your joy is probably one of your great superpowers. If you don't know it yet, remember I said that because tapping into it is going to put you in a vibrational mode where you can always be bringing uh, the magical best to you. It's been a long journey for me. I was an attorney. Uh, I was a business owner until I found my great calling, which is in this work, uh, green community economic development and what we call a whole system solution to the whole system problem common to black communities everywhere. And so a lot of times when I introduce myself, I say, uh, I'm Naomi Davis and I come from white gloves and mud, uh, the proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers. And this is my granny. And we do have a way of, uh, tr of, of tracing our journey from its roots and seeing who, how we have become who we are. And I can say the dignity that you see in my granny, um, was not incongruent with her working shoulder to shoulder with her husband birthing pigs and cows, I mean, uh, calves and sheep and horses and growing every vegetable imaginable on, on their farm. This The roots that I come from have uh, been decisive in determining um, how I uh, wanted to live my life. My mom, the last two words she said, when she, uh, before she passed was the farm, the farm. She grew up understanding that the um, self-sustaining lifestyle 
that um, she came from uh, was rooted in how were we able to support ourselves, be self-sustaining. Sustainability is a word that a lot of people toss around a lot right now, but the ability to sustain. And when we say, and you hear me say, just in case help is not on the way, because a lot of times help ain't on the way. And a lot of times when it's on the way, it's there to help itself. So you have to be prepared, especially in the age of climate crisis, to think about how you, and not just you, we're gonna contextualize this for you. You and a, a small group of good neighbors can get together and save the world um, and saving yourself uh, one household at a time. We are um, here in the age of climate crisis where we know uh, the impacts uh, hit black and brown communities first and worst. We are resourced least and last, and uh, we contribute the least to global warming. And yet here we are um, for the African-American family uh, household, uh, uh, with one tenth the wealth of our, our we call them our cross down cousins, our our white friends and cousins, um, we are in a um, very urgent place right now as a people where we really do want to stand up and show what we're able to do on our own. And when we talk about this incredible courage, creativity, um, the uh, the uh, the work ethic, um, the love, the genius of our people, we love to put it in the context of the movement, the great migration movement, uh, which is that uh, era uh, in American history where 7 million African-Americans voted with their feet and moved up South, we call it, up South for freedom and economic opportunity. And this is um, the iconography of the farm, the train. We traveled when we came up, 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 up North, sometimes it was under cover of night with the Ku Klux Klan and, and uh, torches and flames at our, at our heels. Sometimes it was on foot, sometimes it was by mule, sometimes it was in a car. And in Chicago, the famous IC, uh, train pictured here, we came um, because we recognized we were not free and we were freedom seekers, modern day freedom seekers. And we carry that, um, that um, self-love. We carry that self-love with us in the pride of our heritage. Look back at your own heritage. What are you withdrawing? from your past, from your ancestors to really shore you up and keep you going today. Um, so the sustainable square mile has actually been the outcome of our understanding of how to create self-sustaining black communities today. Back in my mom's day, it was the farm. Uh, everything they ate, they grew. Everything they wore, they made. And they thought they were poor, but guess what? they were rich. And so how to reinvent that self-sustaining uh, environment here in the age of climate crisis, here in the middle of the cities? Well, what you're looking at here is our sustainable square mile. And again, what is that? It's that walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play village, where African-Americans are owning the businesses, own the, owning the land, and living the conservation lifestyle. And what is the conservation lifestyle? Well, back on the farm, where mom grew up, it was one thing. Back in St. Albans, Queens, New York City, where mom grew up, uh, where mom raised her family, me and my brother, she was a master gardener. Um, she uh, was a teacher, she was a dressmaker. She had a model of a household. And you remember, the household is the first economy. You get that right, you have fortitude, you have fuel to be out in the world being um, your contribution to the world. Well, in, in present day, where uh, black communities from East Coast to West, North to South, are typically blighted places. That means vacant land, 
uh, and, um, and, and, and trash and corridors that have been gutted out and there are no businesses and very few businesses. And again, the wealth of the neighbors are one-tenth of those um, just uh, a few, um, just a zip code away. And by the way, where life inspect expectancy um, can, um, can, uh, uh, can reflect a 10 year gap, 10 year gap, you live 10 years shorter in um, these uh, typical black uh, urban places. Well, that uh, trapezoid that you're looking at is our sustainable square mile, our walkable village. It's just, if you look, you can see Jackson Park over on the right, that's where the Obama Presidential Center is going in. You see the Midway Pleasance, that green ribbon going through and across. That's uh, where the University of Chicago is centered, north and south of the, of the Midway. And then Washington Park, altogether a thousand acres of green space. And that uh, little yellow trapezoid is known as Westwood Lawn. It was a stronghold. It was a destination for comers from uh, the South during the Great Migration. And so we call ourselves a Great Migration Legacy Community. And in our legacy community, we happened to be, you can't script this stuff, we happen to have become the owners of the Emmett and Mamie Till Mobley House, the house where Emmett left that day, uh, that summer day in 1955 and never returned. And for those of you who don't know, it's part of the Black culture for you to send your children south for the summer to be with family and to be acculturated and, of course, to give you some time off. But it was a tradition. It's up. All of us came home. Emmett didn't come home. He left from 6427 South St. Lawrence Avenue. And, um, and I think, you know, the rest of the story. Why am I telling you that? Because when you look at your walkable village, your sustainable square mile, you're gonna be able to feel where the boundaries are and you're gonna be able to understand intuitively what are the assets of this place? What, uh, what is this place? What's the past, present and future of this place? Who are the people? What is the architecture? What is the ecology? And you will be able to cultivate for yourself an understanding of how to create economies inside your walkable village uh, because to be self-sustaining means you uh, are able to um, be your own emergency management system. So um, 16 years ago when, when BIG was founded, we, um, we began teaching all around the country about this idea of Chicago as a city of villages. That means every neighborhood can find a way to walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, and walk to play. And that you had to dream it. You had to believe it in order to see it, not the other way around. And so you can see here in this monogram that I'm using my Mississippi fish fry roots as a, as a jumping off place for how to fuel uh, an intersection of deep culture and green neighborhood revival. So um, in our process, Black communities are financed to design, direct, represent, <laughs> the the and this is just like a really basic sentence but it really does encapsulate all of the things that are not happening right now in the various community economic development processes uh are we financed to do this stuff only now because of the biden billions coming down are we measuring our been our, 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 uh, the quality of our programs, the impact of our programs by an increase in household income. We've spent five decades and trillions of dollars doing programs, good, hardworking, well-meaning people uh, working their hearts out to, um, to, it, to uh, advance the interests of people who were disenfranchised. But how do you spend that much time and that much money to produce the opposite result of what you say you're out to do? If a corporation spent 50 years and trillions of dollars to do the opposite, they wouldn't even be in business. So how does Black America have the metrics of health and wealth that are so broken 
And how are we living in places that are so blighted after we had the ear of the world, we were organized, we had cash flows, we had the moral high ground, and 50 years later, we have uh, really dank metrics of health and wealth. Well, we're here to share our sustainable square miles system, which we believe um, fundamentally only a whole system solution can transform the whole system problem common to black communities everywhere. I'm gonna say that again, because it is not a an approach that we find almost anyone else taking when they're designing their programs. Well-meaning people are in their silos doing, oh, I'm into education. Oh, I'm into health. Oh, I'm into violence prevention. Oh, yes, these are all magnificent and critical factors. But we're saying if you're not creating a whole systems approach to the problem, you are not creating a solution. So we have the whole system solution we call the eight principles of green village building. And it's really about how can we be a buffer that the black family needs against the harms of climate crisis. So we're gonna increase your household income when you follow our system. And it's a theory of change. They call it a theory, why? Because we're still working out the metrics on the ground. We don't know if it's gonna fail or succeed, but we're giving it all we've got. And we know it's distinct from what has been done in the past. And we believe it's the way. We're gonna increase the rate at which no neighbor owned businesses are created and sustained. We're gonna build the capacity of neighbors to own, develop and manage the property in their neighborhood. And we're gonna advance that conservation lifestyle, which means what? We're gonna be having households and homesteads that produce their own energy, generate their own food, clean their own water and recycle their own waste. And we call that the beautiful life. So. Um, that is what we are teaching our families to do as we um, implement the eight principles of green village building over an arc of time um, and in a walkable village. So you're going to have an opportunity. I'm going to share with you uh, toward the end. We have a program that is centered around developing block clubs. And, um, and, and, and when we talk about the climate crisis, we need to understand that it's not the cans of meat and the bottles of water in your closet that are gonna serve you and save you when uh, the crisis hits. It's gonna be who, what? It's gonna be your neighbors. It's gonna be the people you are in right relationship with uh, and building those relationships, sometimes it's not easy to do that. When you're protesting, when somebody's wrong, when you gotta band together to deal with an emergency. But what if you're doing activities while you are um, in a peace mode? Can, can you do fun things together, productive things together with your neighbors? And that's our theory about organizing our sustainable square mile. I know the block club is kind of an old fashioned idea, but um, when, uh, like we say, when emergency hits, it's it's going to be those, 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 uh, those neighbors that you're bonded with, that you understand that are going to be your saving grace. So what are we doing? We're building economies and energy, horticulture, housing, tourism, and waste. And what's an economy? That means you have three parts that are in uh, perpetual motion and synchronicity together. You've got your workforce, your employees, you've got your you know, entrepreneurs or your employers, and you've got your households or customers, um, people who are going to buy your goods and services. And when you've got those three things in synchronization and rotation, you've got an economy. Even if it's a teeny weeny little one, what we um, are um, desperate for in the black community I don't know if it's true for your community because when I ride through Little Village, it looks like a very thriving place. I know that there are uh, toxicity issues that are, are very um, persistent. Um, but we do know that um, however different black and brown communities may be, uh, we have a great deal more 
that bonds us, that separates us. And, and one of the things that is, is, is kind of uniquely different is the level of blight in black neighborhoods. So we are out to build an economy in a way that can do two things. Again, increase household income. Peter Drucker says, you can't manage what you don't measure. Over 50 years and all that, that money, we didn't increase household income of black families. And then secondly, the second thing we're gonna do by implementing the eight principles of green village building in your walkable village is we're gonna create an oasis of resilience, an oasis of resilience. You gotta be buffered against uh, the harms of climate crisis. And so um, this is, um, again, how I came to be teaching and uh, consulting in the sustainable square mile system because of the lessons that I learned at my mother's knee growing up. She adored her mom. I adored my mom. And there were um, these propositions that we learned in stories. Your ancestors, they have the key to what can unlock your great future. Um, and so we started um, in our analysis of the problem and the solution, uh, the local solution, by just taking from my grandmother's stories and understanding that uh, there is wisdom, there's indigenous wisdom, okay? What indigenous wisdom are you drawing from? In the eight principles of green village building, which come out of the lessons that are customized to our time and place. I'm gonna dance through those right quick so that you can um, um, kind of get a flavor of them. Uh, each village has its own measures, exchanges and repositories of wealth. Where do you bank? Will your bank give you a loan? That's a repository. Exchanges, you're gonna trade your 10 chickens for why one goat? or are you gonna use dollars? Or are you gonna use Bitcoin? What do you consider to be wealth? And is a wealth um, a five bedroom house with a three car garage, or is it something else? Remember when I talked about my grandparents, everything they ate, they grew, everything they wore, they made, and they thought they were poor, but really they were rich because they were self-sustaining people. So you're gonna define your own, um, uh, your own idea of what wealth is. Second principle of green village building, each village produces and stores its own energy for light, heat and transportation and owns its means of production. We are working on a portfolio of energy, uh, of energy programs. And when we have our block parties and our free events for the community, we have a sheet, we turn it over on the backside, tells a little bit about blacks and green. It lists the eight principles of green village building, but it also lists about 20 different programs that we do in those areas of the economy that we're building. And these are programs free to our public, free to our sustainable square mile members. Why? Because we're gonna build your wealth, your household income via the new green economy. So we're going to be having all of these uh, programs um, available to you, we're just gonna say, look, join your sustainable square mile cohort for three years, make a commitment. Give us your baseline household income going in, enjoy these uh, free programs, being coached and mentored, like we'll hold your hand through them. Um, and we're gonna track the increase of your income over this time. And um, one way that we can produce wealth as well as save money is through energy sovereignty, energy security. You'll hear these phrases. Uh, those of you who wanna know more, we will tap in later, but I'm just kind of giving you an overview right now of what the sustainable square mile um, can uh, be for its neighbors. Each village supplies basic goods and services to neighbors, conver converting waste to wealth in the process. Well, everything has a life cycle. When we put stuff on a barge and send it to Indonesia after we're done with it, um, that, is an, uh, that is an amoral and unsustainable approach to how we 
um, use uh, products that we make. So we're looking at how do we keep uh, circulating our dollars in our neighborhood as well as circulating our waste. And we have a, a, a horticultural economy I mentioned. Well, we say each village is sustained through jobs driven development without displacement, providing low income housing and producing high quality food through land trust CDCs. This is a picture of our, our Mamie Till Forgiveness Garden, which is a half a block down the street from our Emmett and Mamie Till House Museum um, garden and theater in the making. Uh, like I said, it's two and a half million dollars from being done. But on that bottom right corner, you see our version of affordable housing. You know how affordable housing looks, or do you? Uh, because this uh, property is designed to be gorgeous, it's designed to be uh, affordable, and it's designed to do what? Those four things of the conservation lifestyle, generate its own energy, produce its own food, clean its own water, recycle its own waste. How can we at Blacks and Green infill the hundreds of vacant lots in our neighborhood with this kind of new kind of affordable housing? Um, the fifth principle is on culture. Each village celebrates its past, present, and future culture through stories and print, digital, and theatrical forms. Well, this is a picture of the Till House and one of our many events uh, with the elders from our community, um, visitors from afar. Uh, people come from all over the world to visit the Till House. We found when it was publicized that we had purchased the property and by the way, there were squatters in the building. It was boarded up. It was very, very disgusting how it had been desecrated. And that's why we say you define what wealth is to you, because this to us, this house, this emblem, this icon, which triggered the civil rights movement with the murder of Emmett Till, to us, this is a, this is a beacon for wealth and wealth generation. So if we have a whole system problem called Black people hate ourselves or we have a narrative of self-hatred, trust me, it's a, an antidote to that is how do you uh, get together and enshrine your history and thank your ancestors. The sixth principle of green village building, each village is a walkable, self-sustaining whole. Get out and walk your village. Where are the boundaries of your village? You can feel them. They will speak to you in ways that um, you will not experience unless you are walking your village. So it's a walkable, self-sustaining whole with perceptible borders, interdependent local ties, global context. It matters what's happening in South America. Um, organized for self-interest. Don't be ashamed to say, I, I, I want something in my interest. Everybody has it. We have to learn how to live in harmony with each other, but never be ashamed that you are fighting for your self-interest if you have to. And uh, the seventh principle, each village fosters lifelong learning through hubs, which are epicenters for green training, development, and lifestyle transformation. These are depictions of our headquarters here in Woodlawn on South Cottage Grove. And uh, we call ourselves the green hub in the hood. It's where I'm sitting right now, where you can see me uh, in our uh, green living room. Uh, that's the name of our headquarters. And we are that place where people have a go-to spot to get their green education on. Every village needs to have one. Uh, and finally, um, the eighth principle of green village building. Each village circulates its wealth through neighbor-owned businesses, which invent, invest, manufacture and merchandise locally. And what you see here depicted is our great migration guest house. One of the ways that we are generating energy, um, in, uh, generating income for our enterprise is through uh, the uh, hosting of guests in our walkable village. And again, we are creating a tourism economy. So what kind of things do we sell? what kind of lodging, what kind of transportation. And these are the gifts that we uh, give, that keep on giving back to us. So this is uh, our, um, our icon, the center of our village. 
the Emmett and Mamie Till Mobley home with Prairie Garden installation. Uh, and uh, we're going to now kind of wrap up with, Hi, um, huh? Hi, Naomi. Sorry. So sorry to interrupt. Um, but we, the program is coming. Um, we usually end at 630. Oh. Um, so if you wanted to take maybe just a minute or so to wrap yes. up last minute things that you wanted to say, um, yes. but we, do, we do have our student panelists who want to ask you some questions. So okay. we just want to make sure that they can get their questions in. Yes. Beautiful. Well, we, um, we want you to know that we are, um, part of a, Thriving Communities Tic Tac uh, Technical Assistance Center. These are our partners. You can see the University of Illinois uh, School of Public Health is one of our partners and the University of Illinois Smart Energy uh, Design Assistance Center is one of our partners. And we um, are out to make sure that organizations that you are in, that are, that are working in your self-interest are able to connect through um, through our work um, with this EPA grant um, across region five, uh, six states, um, that you are able to tap into the grants that are coming down, the low interest loans and other benefits that uh, President Biden has put in place under the Justice 40 initiative. 40% 40 of the benefits uh, of uh, government-wide programs and 90% of trillions of dollars coming down to the states. Stay in touch with Blacks and Green. We're going to be guiding you to the place where you can touch, uh, touch base with those dollars and be stewarded in filing grants and um, otherwise uh, building the capacity of the organizations in your community to create thriving communities. And we hope that you will join us in advancing the sustainable square mile. But in any case, we wanna make sure that you stay in contact with us um, because uh, we love you. We want only the best uh, for your future as the future of this planet. Thank you so much, Naomi. That was incredible. Um, you also did a great, you, I was worried that we were cutting your presentation short, but I'm glad that it ended up working out um, in good time. Yes. Um, so yeah, so it, that was incredible. It was really great to hear about your own personal histories and obviously the work in the history of Blacks and Green. Um, and now with our remaining time, I'd like to now invite our student panelists to share their questions and thoughts with Naomi. Um, everyone else who's joining us, if you'd like to ask a question or you have any thoughts that you'd like us to relate to Naomi, please feel to do so in the chat or via the Q&A feature. Um, but I'm actually going to pass it off to Ema to start off with their question. So thank you. Hi, Naomi. Um, I really love uh, the fact that um, uh, Blacks and Green... That's why I've been following uh the on Instagram for for I don't remember how long, uh because I love how uh there is um this like education and advocacy and action and art like is everywhere and I tell people like how how people will feel like committed uh to fight against um, environmental injustice if they don't know about it um if they don't understand like what is it either um so uh early this year um i read an article um uh, that was published uh in black and green um that it was a practice uh against uh people's gas um oh, increasing yeah. that rates um last uh week i think uh they were in the chicago city council and uh, that people's gas director said that he didn't read, uh, he didn't know about um, the effects on uh, gas and asthma that he never read an article or like, so what do you think about that? And also I wanted to ask you, uh, where do you find joy now that you mentioned that before? Mm -hmm. um, so these two things and how do you feel about like, this process and people's gas and 
do you have any hope about it? Uh, do you think mm-hmm. what can we do to maybe put more? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to say uh, first to people's gas. Um, you know, we all have our our bright and our shadow sides to us, and so when we talk about kinship it is acknowledging the humanity that we all have. And, and some of us are more challenged than others in being their highest and best uh, fellow denizens of the planet. So there are people who will do anything for money. And there are people who will overlook any kind of humanity for the sake of making a buck. And in the gas industry, and God loves them too, but in the gas industry, you have people who have a, no, a deep knowledge and understanding of the harm that uh, the um, that um, that 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 gas in the household, especially, and all kinds of uh, diesel particulate and other uh, carbon-based um, toxicities. We have a deep understanding, incredible unrefutable documentation of the harm. And yet we will continue to produce this toxin um, rather than select uh, less poisoning um, processes for um, for uh, life essential services. So when People's Gas says, uh, as they did at the hearing at City Hall, we, as you mentioned, Big was in the house. They're going to um, talk about how they have programs to help people pay for their overly expensive gas bills. They're going to talk about how uh, all of these rate increases are needed to pay for these pipe replacements. Why would you take billions and billions? They started at $2 billion when they first proposed their capital plan. Now they're at $11 billion and rising, why would you propose to spend that kind of money across that arc of time for a system for um, for heating that is already antiquated? Look, we used to stab whales to death for heat and light. And when we knew better, we did better, okay? We now know better than than quote unquote natural gas it it's methane is what it is and uh and so when when people's gas pretends that methane isn't uh, a killer and that they and that they're uh it's a good option or it's the best option it's it's people who have lost their moral compass in my opinion and they're not connected to their humanity let alone the humanity of black and brown people who uh suffer the you know, the burdens, uh, the the harms of that. Uh, I, I find my joy in nature, actually. I uh, When I go out into the woods, I discovered I used to live in South Carolina, a very different place than Chicago. Uh, years and years ago, I was so lonely and miserable. I used to burst into tears. I used to jump in my car. And because it was so rural, Within a few minutes, I was in the woods. I was there, like in the wilderness. And I would get out of my car and with my dog and I would, and it was never a time, never a time that I didn't immediately and fully feel well in the woods, no matter how sad I was going in. And so you, you and it's a good question. It's like, where, where do you find your joy? You might find your joy in the, um, what do they call it? The dopamine of uh, binge watching, you know, Netflix. I it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It's your joy, and it's that feeling of joy that is the most magnetic, magical thing that you can ever hope for. Feel your joy. Be happy, regardless of the circumstances. I know it may seem counterintuitive because I know all my life was like. I don't want to be happy because why should I be happy with the world as screwed up as it is? And then I learned that my happiness could be uh, contagious for good things coming to me and coming to others. And so what can you do? Um, 
you it depends on where you find your joy and where you find yourself magnetized what do you love to do what are you good at um who you like to do things with be alert and sensitive for those moments that really make you feel good and then follow the breadcrumbs of that of course come in um volunteer at blacks and green come look we're hiring we're hiring um, we want the best and the brightest of the most caring um, and the most grounded uh, young folks coming out of school today. And we've hired a few recently. Um, and if you want more practical, tactical help with like, what can I do in more detail? Um, call me, text me, email me. Thank you so much for that. And then now I'm actually going to pass it over to Leticia for their question. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi, for the presentation. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about uh, the en energy sovereignty proposal that you've been trying to promote more because it's very important for uh, especially marginalized communities. And in that context, um, how does BIG address the issue of sustainability versus like immediate economic benefits? And how do you communicate the long-term advantages to community stakeholders? Ah, yeah. Say the first part, the last part was communicating that to community stakeholders. What was the first part? Yes. And how do you how does big address the issue of sustainability versus like mm -hmm. immediate economic benefits? Mm. Well, you know, it's it's it it is said that a capitalist will sell you the rope to hang themselves. Um, so it's like you you can um you know, you can there's there's economic development and then there's economic development. How can you create a world in which um, you are contributing to the regeneration of your ecologies, of your people, of uh, the institutions and the business. Are you a force for regeneration? In, this, in the sustainable square mile uh, paradigm, we just say, look, A lot of things have been tried, but mostly people have not tried the sustainable square mile system. We have, we do have invitations across the country that are coming in uh, now since people have heard we've got this $10 million award and we're looking at how to get the word out, connect people to money. But basically um, the sustainable square mile is that way to take care of yourself and your neighbors and the land that you that that provides everything for you between God and the land, they got you. And so I would encourage folks to um, you know, look into the eight principles, come here and visit us in West Woodlawn and see how we're putting together our walkable village. Uh, we are uh, like I said, uh, building economies and energy, horticulture, housing tourism and waste. And um, we believe that with that kind of mechanism in gear and operating, it will disrupt the whole system problem that uh, that is so familiar to us and give us a chance to really fall in love with each other as well. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So we do have a few more questions um, that we still plan to go through tonight, um, but it is after 630. So we just want to give our goodbye announcement for folks who do need to leave the space, but we're still going to come back after and continue to um, ask the questions. But we just wanted to like be cognizant of people's times. Um, so yeah, so thank you everyone who came to our last virtual Climates of Inequality program for this academic year. Um, we wanted to thank everyone who's been here tonight and everyone who's also participated in our previous Climates of Inequality programs. Um, if you're interested in watch in rewatching the recording of this amazing presentation with Naomi, um, it's available on our LCC website. And if you're also interested in any of our previous conversations um, with Southeast Side activists and co-executive director of the South 
Southeast Environmental Task Force, Oscar Sanchez, or our conversation with Neighbors for Environmental Justice director and founder, Alfredo Romo. Alfredo! Yeah, so yeah, so it's a lot of I, a lot of the people that I'm sure you're very aware of. Um, those recordings are also available on our website. And so we hope to see you at future programming. And again, thank you so much for the support in this series and for being here tonight. Um, and that being said, this is not a goodbye. I'm actually going to pass it over to Tanisa, who's, um, if they're, if they're able to unmute themselves, they'll ask their question. Hi, yeah, um, I just wanted to ask how we can um, make these community spaces without the risk of um, gentrification and stuff like that, because I know when communities start getting better, it seems to be more of a, an opportunity for the wealthier people to move in and to, um, you know, just continue um pushing people of color and the less fortunate away um <laughs> from the better opportunities to where we have the you mm -hmm. know more dirty and sacrifice zones because i feel like that's just how our city has operated for the longest time um and i just wanted to know how you guys um acknowledge that and um just what you guys do to make sure that the wealth stays within the community and doesn't mm -hmm. get, um, you know, like superseded with uh, people who want in mm -hmm. on you yeah. know, the trendy places like what's happening in Pilsen. It's happening everywhere. Uh, you know, we call it the rape and rescue cycle. First, you strangle a neighborhood to death by failing to... Uh, provide access to capital and you depreciate everything they have and you you know we you know the whole system problem as we call it um and then you come back heroically with a program that's going to allow certain people to be able to um you know they call it uh, renew or, you know, there was urban renewal and, you know, what a, a tragedy that was, but they're going to come back riding a white charger with a lot of programs and, and uh, young people who have graduated from urban planning schools. They've never met a black person. They've never met a Brown person. They, they come in, they get a job, they have authority, they have budget, they, um, they have a plan and uh, only problem is they haven't asked you anything about what uh, you uh, dream for and need for your community. So wealth disparity to place displacement or green gentrification, it's a, it's a, it's a well-known phenomenon. Um, but guess what? I got good news and I got bad news. Um, the playbook works because the playbook uh, just, you know, because people keep using it. Um, the play, the playbook, the rape and rescue playbook that I just mentioned. I'm going to just say from Blacks and Greens perspective, there's no substitute for ownership of the land. Well, but I can't afford to buy. Well, are you sure you can't afford it? Because part of what we do, uh, and I know that um, uh, uh, Latinx communities uh, have a very um, grounded and uh, indigenous memory of different models for living together. Cooperative living is one way. In, a, in the African traditions, there's um, in Caribbean traditions, um, in the African diaspora, we have the Esusu, and that's a way of uh, collectively putting in monthly into a pool of funds and each, and you know, each family puts their money in every month. And then, uh, you know, every period uh, they have a lottery and one person gets to take the money and get the and buy the house. It's a it's it's a it's a structure that's grounded in what kinship you you trust each other to be part of a collective. Uh, there are. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, uh, where are you banking? Will your will your bank give you a loan? 
Um, if you if it doesn't, you should move your money. If it does, you should start looking collectively at the at the neighborhood at how the bank can craft programs that are more sensitive to and acculturated to the 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 assets and the and the deficits of the marketplace of the people. So uh, you got to buy your own land, and uh, you know, and 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 in, in, in West Woodlawn, it's eighty five percent investor owned. That means you're a colony. That means anytime people get ready to put you out, you're gone. On the other hand, we do not subscribe to the just green enough approach, which which was flourishing, uh, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago, where you, you're going to make improvements, but not so much that it's attractive to outsiders. Well, that's ridiculous. You've heard from the Bible, do not put your light under a bushel. Do not depreciate what you can do and the beauty that you do want in your neighborhood because somebody else might want it. You have got to, we have a practice called God, which is garden-oriented development. So we're green on steroids. We have, we own about nine parcels in our neighborhood. We have different approaches to uh, developing them, whether they're we look for the highest and best use for each parcel. And it's not necessarily a quick game. And sometimes there's urgencies, like when the Obama Presidential Center came to the neighborhood, I sent up a flare and a warning, uh-oh, watch what's gonna be happening to the prices. You can organize. You can, in, in Woodlawn, um, a, a huge resistance effort was launched by neighbors to get our alder woman, um, Jeanette Taylor to create a, an affordable housing ordinance. Uh, you know, is it a silver bullet? No, but it's a lot better than a sharp stick in the eye. And there are 25% set asides for uh, housing that's affordable to uh, low and moderate uh, income families. And, uh, and I would say um, the most important thing is believing and loving. Um, have that vision of what is that place that you want uh, and be frank with the comers and let them know, look, God loves you too. And I'm trying to love you the best I can, but do understand the impact. And I actually said this to some University of Chicago students, don't move into the neighborhood, please. Just don't come here. It's not helping. All right. You have every place you can live. You go live there. We'll visit. We'll have lunch. We'll do all the things that people who care about each other do. But if you come, understand the impact that you're going to have on the economy in my neighborhood. Our housing prices have tripled in the past five years. Just by the hair of my chinny chin chin, I was able to buy something this year, this January. And so I hope that gives you some insight or some light uh, for the question that you asked. It does, thank you. Thank you for that. And so we have one more question from our student panelists. This comes from Alden, um, who's right there on the screen. And by the way, that got uh, the students, when I asked them that, they don't come. I mean, I mean, you'll find that there are people who care and are sensitive, but you got to play the card. You got to say, look, you you, you want to be an ally? This is, this, there are new terms of engagement. There are, equity takes many forms. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. And just in terms of like institutions role and our roles as like students and like academics and like, even if you have good intentions, you also have to think about what your what your physical positionality is also doing to the spaces. No, thank you for that. Um, but so yeah, so our next question comes from our student panelist, um, Alden. And their question is, what has been the most impactful part of your work to you personally and why? Mm. Well, let's see. In some of the presentations that we do, I talk about the people, specific individuals, historic figures, and some even alive today, who had um, a, just a transformative impact on me. And um, and one of the 
um, one of those those great impacts um, had to do with um, was was a, there was a quote from us uh, Adam Clayton Powell who was a who was a congressman in in New York City uh, during the time I was coming up and he he said you know start with what's in your hand because you can get really fancy in your thinking and you should dream big and you should um you know go for it throw your hat over the wall and just declare uh your triumph um and along the way just get started somewhere so when blacks and green first moved to west woodlawn in 2010 i had lost all my real estate i was flat broke my spirit was broken and all I could do is just collapse into the cheapest apartment I could find, recover my sanity, and then get up and out and look around me. And what I um, what I discovered once I had the peace of mind to see was what a beautiful tree canopy there was in my neighborhood. And um, you know the uh, the architecture was so handsome, and um, and I, and I, you know, we were, I think about three years old at that point. And I was like, well, we don't have any money. And, um, you know, I don't have any staff. What can I do? And, 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 and realizing that people want to see something, you know, if you're out there and you're advocating and all you're doing is this, but you don't have anything to show for it. So I took my deep love of the garden and natural spaces and began to make a series of beautiful gardens in the neighborhood, which became, um, you know, the bedrock of our garden-oriented development approach uh, to this great migration legacy communities. And one of the things that, you know, I mentioned my mom was a master gardener and my grandparents were master farmers. Well, I kind of have a brown thumb, you know, I'm not really that good at uh, growing plants, but one of the things that I have had the grace to support and observe at Blacks and Green, because we have our own nursery where we grow um, vegetables from seed and uh, we grow them uh, from seed. Uh, they get a few uh, weeks or month old and we transfer them to our outdoor raised bed gardens. And I'll tell you, when you put that seed in the ground and we we kept it, uh, our nursery was in the lower level. So we had um, heat lights and heat beds and, you know, moisture, uh, you know, continuous moisture. You can actually, from one day to the next, see something grow. You can see it. And it is a gift from God as glorious as anything I know to... Um, you know, to to see the, the the work of nature, the work of the creator and the work of your hand in tandem as a partner in creation, um, that has been the most impactful part of this work for me. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And it was also, that was our final question of the night. Um, So it was also really lovely to just sort of end on like a really uplifting note and like doing climate and environmental justice work is really hard, especially when, you know, you're looking at like our South and West sides of Chicago. Um, So it was just really great to hear like your personal histories and just how you're doing the work, but also, you know, like you're also like finding your joy and living your life um as you said so that I that was just really appreciated so I just wanted to like give a little a little extra love for that um <laughs> there and so I also I re-put in your email and then your phone number that you offered in the chat just so folks want to reach out to Naomi um afterwards please feel free to do so also I'm sorry I realized that we were taking a screenshot or I think I, is it if is it okay if we take a quick uh picture for for the program? Okay. Oh yeah, okay by me. Okay, awesome. Um, but yeah, that was really great. And this brings our program to a close. And thank you so much, Naomi, for being our final program um of our climate of inequality series tonight. Bless you, and don't be a stranger.
Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who stayed. I know we went a little over time, so it's always appreciated. Yes. <laughs> Bye now. Thank you so much, Naomi. Thank Have you, a good Naomi. night. Good night. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, this was wonderful. And we'll definitely stay in touch, please. Please, please do that. Okay, bye now. Okay, be healthy.